Welcome to this week's View on Africa. My name is Alan Gary. I'm a researcher with the Transnational Threats and International Crime Division of the, International, of the Institute for Security Studies. This week, we shall address the question of access to justice in the African continent. And to be clear, we are referring to access to national, regional, and continental judicial structures by individuals and interested groups related to gross violations of human rights and serious international crimes. And these are occasioned during conflict situations. Most African states can be said to be in a post-conflict or a conflict situation. Some still remain embroiled in conflicts, most notably and recently Burundi, the Central African Republic, and South Sudan, just to name a few. In any case, either post-conflict or conflict, gross violations of human rights and serious violations of the laws and customs of conflict have led to serious crimes occasioned on citizens of African states. And these crimes, by their very nature, are of international concern. So how do African states and regional integration mechanisms address the challenges of access to justice in the face of other national or regional concerns? And can access to justice for individuals and other concerned groups enhance respect for the rule of law and, a pre and prevent a recurrence of violence in African societies? To respond to these questions key to the concept of access to justice, this presentation will address human rights, international crimes, and transnational and transitional justice frameworks at the national level, that is with national courts, national human rights institutions, at the regional level, that is, at the East African community, the economic community of West African states, and the Southern African development community. And finally, in the continental, at the continental levels, through the entities that are established by the African Union. Starting with national mechanisms, states remain the most proximate entity um, through which gross human rights violations and international crimes can be addressed. Now, we are absolutely certain that um, strengthening of these mechanisms, national criminal justice systems, for instance, remains uh, the best avenue through which we can address uh, mass atrocity crimes in the African continent. Few African states have legislation that specifically address the investigation, prosecution, or trial of international crimes. This is a serious impediment to providing justice for mass atrocity crimes in the continent. There are a few countries, however, that have domesticated the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, thereby providing substantive law and procedures for addressing international crimes domestically. However, it is also important to mention that um, domestication of the Rome Statute of the ICC is not the only way in which states can address international crimes. States can legislate on their own um, through their own internal processes, laws that uh, will address international crime outside of the Rome Statute. However, the Rome Statute does provide um, a, a good basis for, for national legislations to emulate. More efforts, however, should be placed on supporting national criminal justice systems to effectively address international crimes. And this includes strengthening um, witness protection regimes, victim participation, uh, victim participation and reparations, and enhancing the capacity of investigative, prosecutorial, judicial authorities to deal with these crimes. The role of national human rights institutions is very important. It's invaluable in the sense that national human rights institutions promote, protect, and respect, and provide for the respect of human rights, both by state and non-state actors. These institutions, however, face grave challenges and uh, impede their effectiveness. And some of these challenges include a lack of funding, um, a lack of uh, political will in the state to ensure that this body functions well. Uh, and this cripples the operations of this of these institutions and worse are incompetent biased and politically aligned commissioners that can provide or that can uh, present a serious impediment to the functioning of national human rights institutions 
as to transitional justice mechanisms. Truth commissions um, singled out as one mechanism within the transitional justice mechanism uh, or framework that, that could support uh, the, the addressing of past atrocities. We have had a few truth commissions in this continent, um, most notably in South Africa. We've had truth commissions in West, in, in the West African region, um, in Sierra Leone, as well as in the East African region. We've had uh, a truth commission in Kenya. There is a proposed truth commission in South Sudan to address the conflict that uh, has recently been in that country, as well as in Burundi, um, also with respect to the conflict, not just related to this, uh, the, past, the past few years or the past year, but um, a conflict uh, emanating from as far back as, uh, as, as the contents of the agreement in 2000 that was agreed in Arusha. Uh, by the by, the parties in uh, compete uh, by uh, the parties that were in conflict in Burundi. But uh, just to to move very quickly on to um, uh, regional mechanisms, some people call these sub-regional mechanisms. We'll start with the Economic Community of West African States (ECOWAS). It's Community Court of Justice. The organs of ECOWAS are set out in Article 6, and the Community Court of Justice is one of these uh, organs. It's open to all ECOWAS member states and serves to adjudicate on issues of human rights as well as interstate disputes, among others. This mechanism is unique as a, reg as a regional mechanism because it specifically provides for uh, human rights um, adjudication which is quite apart and separate from, uh, from other re sub-regional mechanisms, which we'll, we will discuss in this presentation. As I have mentioned, the court is set apart also from um, the African Commission or the African Court, for instance, by a number of factors. For instance, one need not exhaust local remedies in order to approach this court. Moreover, the court has secured broader jurisdiction than other similar forums and has also offered direct access to individuals bringing forth claims of human rights violations. The court has proved to be a viable option, an avenue for seeking recourse over human rights violations. <clears throat> While compliance remains um, quite a, a significant challenge to, to, this, to this court, um, and most notably we, we recall the case uh, um, revolving Gambia's non-compliance with two rulings that have been issued by, by the ECOWAS Community Court, it can be said that the court has significantly increased access to justice for those within the region. Moreover, measures have been taken to increase state compliance with judgments handed down by the court. The next court is the East African Court of Justice, which is a ju judicial body established by the East African Community Treaty under Article 9 of that treaty. Although the focus of the East African community has primarily been on economic regional integration, human rights issues have been of um, increasing concern to the community as it moves into deeper reintegration, uh, uh, regional integration. Jurisdiction for this court, however, is limited to the interpretation of the East African Community Treaty ensuring compliance with the East African uh, Community Treaty and the subsidiary laws under, under the treaty. The court does not have jurisdiction specifically to hear complaints of human rights violations, although it is implied that, um, that it is possible to bring cases before this court as long as it is hinged upon East African community law. There is no requirement to exhaust local remedies before approaching this court, therefore increasing the chances or increasing the opportunities of access to this court. Certain challenges, however, have been noted with the East African Court of Justice um, that impede access to justice, and this include um, that the applicant uh, is usually one that has to fund the litigation, and this is a costly costly issue and therefore impedes um, the, the, the number of cases that can be brought up that, that could relate to human rights violations. Um, and with respect to mass atrocity crimes, um, while this court does not have specific jurisdiction to address international crimes, 
there was a case um, that was decided by the appeals division of the East African Court of Justice in 2011 that uh, limit that li that put a time limit of two months on on, on mass atrocity cases, and, and that would have been a potential case that we could have um, heard. Uh, the East African Court of Justice make a pronouncement on it related to a case uh, in, in Kenya um, of human rights violations in the Mount Elgon region. The Southern African Development Community Tribunal is our third regional mechanism to address. It was initiated with the intended purpose of overseeing the compliance of the SADC Treaty by the 15 SADC member states and to adjudicate upon disputes between the member states. The tribunal had the jurisdiction to hear cases concerning human rights as well. After its inception, the tribunal passed rulings on several controversial cases in the region. One of these rulings eventually led to the suspension of the body and raised questions as to whether the SADC member states were ready for the type of commitments affirmed in the SADC treaty and indeed towards building progressively towards a greater human rights dispensation in the region. In 2008, the SADC Tribunal ruled in the controversial case on expropriation of land without compensation by the state of Zimbabwe. The case was Mike Campbell Limited and others versus the Republic of Zimbabwe. The tribunal found in favor of the applicants and in this case found that Zimbabwe was in breach of the principles set out by the SADC Treaty concerning human rights, the rule of law, and non-discrimination. Zimbabwe dismissed the ruling and announced that it was withdrawing from the tribunal's jurisdiction. The ruling was never complied with and non-compliance was later raised as a concern by the tribunal before the SADC summit. Aside, for dis aside from disregarding uh, this ruling, Zimbabwe proceeded to lobby other SADC member states to support its proposition uh, to support its position, rather, and it argued that the tribunal's ruling amounted to an interference in Zimbabwe's domestic affairs. SADC member states, with the exception of Botswana, refused to take a stance against Zimbabwe, and in 2010, it was announced that the heads of state had suspended the tribunal for a period of six months. The terms of the tribunal officials were not renewed and no officials were appointed. The president of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe, held that the suspension of the tribunal meant that the ruling against Zimbabwe was nullified. The summit subsequently decided that a new protocol was to be adopted in order to revise the role and the jurisdiction of the tribunal. And so at the SADC summit in 2014, the new protocol was adopted and signed, but this protocol has yet to come into force. It has yet to be ratified by the members of SADC, thereby leaving the SADC tribunal inoperative for the time being. One effective, once effective, the new protocol will entail significant changes to the tribunal Notably, that only states will be able to bring um, cases against um, another state, so it will be limited to state jurisdiction only, or state disputes only. And the jurisdiction of the body um, will effectively leave no mechanism in place to deal with claims of human rights violations by individuals or groups in the Southern African region. And this is quite a, a blow to, um, to the efforts of, of many civil society as well as state actors in the past that have championed for a human rights dispensation in the Southern African region. And this therefore is clear that there is no access to victims of human rights violations in this region through this SADC tribunal. The Comesa Court of Justice is also an important um, court which does provide for, um, for a human rights dispensation. However, it is very limited um, in the sense that it, uh, the Comesa Court of Justice um, basically 
interprets the, um, the, the treaty, um, the Comesa agreement between the, Comesa, the states that have signed into the Comesa agreement, um, but, but does not specifically look into human rights violations and has not had uh, a case uh, dealing with human rights violations. The Economic Community of Central African States, Court of Justice, established by the Economic Community of Central African States Treaty, Article 16, also has no direct provisions granting human rights protection, therefore no judicial enforcement available on human rights issues. The Intergovernmental Authority on Development, the EGAD, its agreement does not make provision for a judicial body and therefore individual human rights violations cannot be enforced at the EGAD level. And lastly, uh, the Arab Maghreb Union, AMU Court of Justice, also not endowed with uh, a human rights dispensation and therefore cannot listen to human rights cases related to human rights violations. At this stage, it can be concluded that altogether, human rights protection plays a vital role at the sub-regional levels, while ECCAS, ECAS, EGAD, and AMU have a less developed system of human rights protection, COMESA, the EAC, and to some extent, the earlier SADC treaty had integrated human rights to a more elaborated extent to their legal frameworks. But more importantly, with respect to mass atrocity crimes, none of, these crime, none of these courts have an international crimes framework or jurisdiction to address mass atrocities. Although in the wake of the anti-ICC sentiments, there was talk about endowing the East African Court of Justice with an international crimes jurisdiction. On to continental mechanisms. There are over 18 African Union treaties and protocols relating to democracy, governance, human rights, and the fight against impunity. The African Charter on Human and People's Rights is at the very center of the African human rights system. The African Commission on Human and People's Rights, which is a body that has been established under the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, was established in 1987 with a view towards promoting and protecting human rights as envisioned in the African Charter. According to the Charter, the Commission may hear complaints from states, organizations and individuals regarding violations of the rights embodied in the Charter. The subsequent action of the Commission comes in the form of recommendations to states' parties in question or to the African Union Assembly. The challenge with this mechanism, however, is that the decisions of the Commission are not legally binding and therefore they cannot be enforced. There are four courts of note in the African Union legal framework. The first is the African Court on Human and People's Rights, based in Arusha, and established by the Protocol to the African Charter on the Establishment of an African Court on Human and People's Rights, established in 1988. The court's role is complementary to that of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, and also aims to protect and to promote human rights on the continent. Based on its findings, the court is entitled to make whatever orders it deems necessary to redress violations, including the payment of compensation. So in theory, states who are parties to the protocol to the African Charter, um, on, uh, to the protocol on the establishment of the African Human Rights Court, are bound to execute the judgments handed down by the court within the time frames that are stipulated by the court. Access to the court is provided under Article 5.3 of the protocol, one to the commission, to states parties involved in a case, to African intergovernmental organization, and somewhat controversially, to non-governmental organizations and individuals 
However, this is subject to a declaration deposited by a state that accepts that individuals and non-governmental organizations within its state can lodge an application to the court for hearing of a matter. And this is a provision that a declaration in line with Article 34.6 of the protocol. To date, there has been a limited number of states that have adopted or, or that have uh, lodged declarations according to Article 34.6 of the protocol. Burkina Faso, Mali, Malawi, Tanzania, Ghana, and Cote d'Ivoire are the only states that have lodged this, uh, this declaration. Rwanda withdrew its declaration earlier this year. The framework has come under immense criticism for not offering automatic access to the court by those who are most in need of access to justice and the remedies that such justice entails. The next is the African Court of Justice, established by the Protocol of the Court of Justice of the African Union in 2003. This court is not in existence. It never came into operation, but this court would have only listened to interstate disputes among African member states. The third court is the African Court of Justice on Human uh, and on human rights established by the protocol on the statute of the African Court of Justice and Human Rights in 2008 in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt. This court also has not come into force um, uh, through the protocol that established it. The final court, which is of, of interest for us, is the African Court of Justice and Human and People's Rights established by the protocol on amendments to the protocol and the statute of the African Court of Justice and Human Rights, um, commonly referred to as the Malabo Protocol that was adopted by the African Union Heads of State and Government in Malabo, Equatorial Guinea in June of 2014. This protocol establishes a tri-jurisdictional court. That means that, um, that this future court, this future African Court of Justice and Human and People's Rights, will have a, juris a chamber that deals with interstate disputes and general affairs, a second chamber that deals with human rights uh, violations and adjudication thereof. And this is akin to the current African court that sits in Arusha or the functions there thereof. And finally, it's the extended uh, jurisdiction that is of, of, of interest to us at this particular moment which is the, uh, the, 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 third, the third chamber that deals with an international crimes jurisdiction. Subject matter of uh, this, this court uh, or this chamber that deals with international um, crimes will include, will include 14, um, 14 crimes, the subject, matter of the, the subject matter jurisdiction of the court will include uh, a genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes, uh, and the, the definitions of these uh, of these crimes are very similar to that which we find in the Rome Statute of the ICC and expansions thereof by the International Committee of the Red Cross with respect to war crimes. Uh, the unconstitutional change of governments, and this is reflective of um, some of the provisions of the African Charter on, um, on democracy, elections and governance, and other crimes that have been of great concern to the African continent such as corruption, money laundering, illicit, um, explo illicit exploitation of natural resources, terrorism, piracy, mercenarism, trafficking in persons, drugs, and hazardous waste. The personal jurisdiction of this court extends beyond natural persons and includes legal persons. So what this protocol has done is that it has extended criminal responsibility beyond individual criminal responsibility as we understand it in, um, for example, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court and includes corporate criminal liability. In this context, it um, increases access to justice. Uh, this is a positive development. The Ogoniland reference before the African Commission on Human and People's Rights comes to mind 
where in that case, um, if there was corporate uh, criminal liability, it would have been possible then to see some of the multinational companies involved in that case and other similar cases um, uh, put to task for uh, crim corporate criminal liability. Max Duplessis, professor of law at the University of KwaZulu-Natal and an ISS senior research associate in a paper available um, in the ISS uh, website and, and, and displayed here, um, speaks quite uh, strongly uh, about this protocol, this Malabo protocol, and he discusses what he calls the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of the protocol. Um, in addition to the expanded list of crimes that I have mentioned, um, the, 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 the good points of this protocol includes the establishment of an office of a principal defender alongside chambers, the office of the prosecutor, and the registry as organs of the court. Now, this is quite significant in the sense that there's not a single international court at the moment that has placed um, the office of the defense in equality of arms as an organ with the office of the prosecutor, chambers, and registry. Other good aspects of the protocol include a, um, a strong emphasis on victim and witness protection and reparations. Witness protection is the cornerstone of any criminal justice system without which high profile cases as are likely to be before the African court will not stand. Unfortunately, the protocol does not have substantive provisions relating to the participation of victims in criminal proceedings. This is a crucial aspect of criminal proceedings in international crimes cases as its benefits are beyond the retributive model that, um, uh, that criminal justice um, uh, brings forward, but it also brings the restorative aspect of justice for victims who participate and express their views and concerns in proceedings. The ugly, it rests entirely with a provision that relates to immunity for heads of state and for um, uh, for, for senior government officials, Article 46 A bis, which states that, in quote, no charges shall be commenced or continued with before the court against any serving African Union head of state or government or anybody acting, uh, uh, anybody acting or entitled to act in such capacity or other senior state officials based on their functions during their tenure of office. No doubt that this provision vitiates any gains that have been made in the continent towards the fight against impunity for international crimes, because it is often very um, clear that heads of state um, and government and senior government officials are implicated or alleged to have committed uh, mass atrocity crimes uh, in the, the wake of, of, of conflict. Questions have been raised as to the wisdom of excluding certain powerful individuals from prosecutions. Some commentators have, however, suggested that while it would not be possible under this protocol to prosecute heads of state and government and senior government officials, it may be possible, however, to proceed with investigations because the wording of, the, of this article does not impede investigations while these officials are in office. This, however, poses um, grave challenges or many significant challenges uh, by the very nature of the fact that the scene of crime is within the territorial control of the heads of state or senior government officials and therefore making investigations difficult, if not impossible. And the cases before the International Criminal Court have demonstrated this difficulty quite, quite clearly. So um, lastly would be the African Union Transitional Justice Policy Framework, which has yet to be adopted by the African Union, um, but uh, there have been significant steps to bring together uh, a number of mechanisms that would be available uh, to states um, through this policy framework to address uh, mass atrocities, to address uh, gross violations of human rights, and to increase um, the opportunities for the victims of these uh, conflicts and atrocities to to to, uh, to to gain justice. So truth commissions being one of those, we spoke about that earlier, 
um, but there would also be opportunities for uh, criminal prosecutions to happen, reparations uh, within that scheme of, 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 of uh, transitional justice mechanisms and various other mechanisms such as memorialization and other efforts that are aimed at um, ensuring that there is no recurrence to violence um, in, in African states. So uh, at this point, uh, we'll stop so that then we, um, we can take some questions. Um, but for now, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I, I lastly put up the slide that relates to the African continent and you can see um, which countries have signed the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which have, uh, have, have given access to, um, to, to, vic to, to um, individuals and non-governmental organizations to, make ca to bring cases before the African court. Um, as well as uh, member states or states parties to the International Criminal Court statutes.